Brought to you through the courtesy of Belize Electricity Limited, Zicho International, Universal Hardware, Cravens Restaurant, Moya Shepherd and Company Limited, Slingshot Science and Advertising, Rocky's Salon Studio. I am your host, Sanaida Moya, and I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this very informative, insightful, and empowering. We're going to have a longer show, so I'm going to say an hour and a quarter. <laughs> As you know, the objective of this show is to inform, educate, and empower you, our viewers. We will be discussing different issues. Of course, tonight we have a specific issue in a particular area. However, the show will be discussing business, the economy, society, culture, mm -hmm. laws, politics, and the environment. So you will get a chance to hear from the Senator Moya show as it regards these different topics. I am an economist, a former trade union leader, a former elected official, a former head of department in a government service. So I am very keen on ensuring that our Belizeans understand the importance of knowing what is happening in his or her country as it regards the economy, politics, society, and in different areas. I believe that's the only way we are going to be better equipped to make better informed decisions. I want to state that the views expressed on this show are those of our guests and not necessarily those of myself or unless they are coming from me or of this channel. Our topic today is a continuation of last week's topic. Last week we had a very informative and insightful one hour show. It was a show based on a 100 day policy plan that has been outlined by the US President elect Donald Trump. It was released by his transition team, and, it, and in it he had stated that as he enters office, he is going to withdraw from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a partnership that is, that is designed to bring together 12 countries, including the US. Uh, we know, however, that the US is close to our country of Belize, and so what affects the US affects us. And so we had to discuss that issue. It's, it's a big deal because that 12 member country had 800 million consumers. That's a lot. That's like 40% and it accounts to like 40% of the trade economy of the world. So it's a big deal. Belize wasn't going to be a part of it. And really a lot of the jobs and investments were going to go towards the Pacific area. So, whether you appreciate Trump or you do not appreciate Trump, a lot of Belizeans and of course our Americans and our Belizean Americans living in the US can breathe a sigh of relief that President-elect Donald Trump is fighting to ensure those jobs or more jobs stay in the US and within the Western Hemisphere. So 
I believe that's a positive so far as it regards to him and that's if it continues because of course this proposed policy is based on whether or not he goes through with it when he enters the White House. So we discuss that and we also discuss the fact that of course China is not a part of it so 1.38 billion Chinese had they been a part of it that was going to be huge but nonetheless the US's 250 million population would account for 31 percent of this proposed single block it's a single block so while we have CARICOM you know, uh, we're a part of CARICOM, more of us know about CARICOM, uh, NAFTA uh, we're not, uh, the, you have the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement that is Mexico, the US, Canada. But we are close to the CARICOM, of course, the European Union. So this proposed trade bloc would have incorporated two times the number of persons of the European Union. So just imagine the size. Tonight, we are going to discuss something that's very relevant because President-elect Donald Trump mentioned, he said, that his intention of even withdrawing from that TPP, or Trade Pacific Partnership, is because he instead wants to renegotiate via bilateral agreements. He wants to bring back jobs and industry back onto U.S. Shores, of course, your shores. We write along, and we have our Belizean Americans living there. So, but another thing he discussed was the immigration policy, and he mentioned. He said, "Listen," he said, "When I get into office, I'm going to direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker." This is very relevant to us. After all, we have a lot of Belizean Americans living in the U.S. We also have, of course, uh, Belizeans that are applying for visa. Hey, we also have Belizeans living in the U.S. that may that may not have their documents in place. And of course, we have a lot of transfers or remittances uh, that we that we get from our Belizean Belizean American uh, brothers and sisters abroad that come into Belize. You hear of your Zetra International. Uh, they deal with uh, money transfers as well. So there are certain things and tonight I'm going to be speaking a little um, and we will also have two very distinguished guest experts that will be discussing the relevant issues. We have on my immediate left attorney at law and economist Arthur Saliva. Arthur is a Fulbright scholar. Arthur also holds the distinction of being uh, an economist with honors and also having degrees in international studies, diplomacy, and of course I told you law. He has been in practice since 2008. Welcome to the show, Arthur. Thank you very much, Tanaida. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. And we have on my far left, Belizean American. <laughs> Patrick, I have to say that. Sure. Professor Patrick Menzies. Patrick holds many hats, but for the sake of tonight, we're going to say that Patrick not only has an MBA with distinction from Keller Graduate School of Management in Houston, Texas, and has done his studies in the US, but he has also served as a foreign service officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where he developed and coordinated the diaspora program for Belize. And he's the president of several NGOs based in Houston, Texas. Uh, he's an outspoken advocate, Patrick, Welcome to the Sinai and Moya show. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. All right, before we go on, I mentioned about this short video. It's only a two and a half minute video. We're going to listen, especially for those who were not uh, here with us in the show. We are going to listen to that quick video and then we'll come back. 
Today, I would like to provide the American people with an update on the White House transition and our policy plans for the first 100 days. Our transition team is working very smoothly, efficiently, and effectively. Truly great and talented men and women, patriots indeed, are being brought in, and many will soon be a part of our government, helping us to make America great again. My agenda will be based on a simple core principle, putting America first. Whether it's producing steel, building cars, or curing disease, I want the next generation of production and innovation to happen right here on our great homeland, America, creating wealth and jobs for American workers. As part of this plan, I've asked my transition team to develop a list of executive actions we can take on day one to restore our laws and bring back our jobs. It's about time. These include the following. On trade, I am going to issue our notification of intent to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a potential disaster for our country. Instead, we will negotiate fair bilateral trade deals that bring jobs and industry back onto American shores. On energy, I will cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. That's what we want. That's what we've been waiting for. On regulation, I will formulate a rule which says that for every one new regulation, two old regulations must be eliminated. So important. On national security, I will ask the Department of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to develop a comprehensive plan to protect America's vital infrastructure from cyber attacks and all other form of attacks. On immigration, I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. On ethics reform, as part of our plan to drain the swamp, we will impose a five-year ban on executive officials becoming lobbyists after they leave the administration, and a lifetime ban on executive officials lobbying on behalf of a foreign government. These are just a few of the steps we will take to reform Washington and rebuild our middle class. I will provide more updates in the coming days as we work together to make America great again for everyone. And I mean everyone. All right. We just heard that short video from U.S. President-elect Donald Trump outlining his 100-day policy plan. We also heard his immigration policy plan whereby he speaks about abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. So let us understand a little bit more about that. Here to help us with that, I'm going to ask first Attorney at Law, Arthur Saliver. Good night again, uh, Snyder. Um, here's the situation as it relates to, to immigration. We recognize that whenever we have persons coming in, to a country to add to the labor pool that there will be an effect and that effect largely impacts the labor market like any other thing when you have a supply of labor or a supply of anything that meets the particular demand at the time the supply in terms of what it commands in terms of prices will be dependent on the demand for it so if there is an oversupply of manual labor, for example, in the market, then the minimum wage that is prevalent at the time before immigrants come in would be impacted after they come in. Yes. So this is one of the ways corporations manipulate the system to gain an advantage over the worker, which undermines the working class. What it does, by virtue of having many immigrants come in especially let's say in florida for example mm -hmm. whenever there's harvest season in florida for oranges the picking of oranges there's a policy that allows for uh, persons from mexico and other countries to come in to do picking in the groves yes now you still have in the rural parts of florida uh, many towns and uh, cities many black towns and, and, and cities that contribute to that labor pool. But when you have an, a large influx of migrant workers, there is 
a natural push down right. in what persons receive yes because they are now competing with a different set of labor conditions people who are coming in as of course that happens in Belize <laughs> no and I yeah, want I, I want to make the correlation <laughs> yes because what Mr. what Donald Trump is doing and what he has basically set forward is consistent with what he has done with TPP as well which is to basically give the American worker the confidence in understanding and appreciating that there's somebody at the upper echelon of government fighting for them and where he is looking particularly at the Department of Labor because that is the key he is saying listen this is your job Secretary of Labor and the Department of Labor you got to look at how the American worker is being undermined and impacted by the policies that allow for visas to be granted to persons simply to come in to work in these manual labor jobs because that's mainly it yes. it's in the manual labor area the unskilled labor area that this is most uh, um, impactful mm -hmm. because what it does it basically eliminates job opportunities for those in the u.s who would have fit those positions what the immigration policy should always be looking at is to fill gaps that cannot be filled by your local labor force so that you're not displacing people but you're simply complementing and supporting as opposed to totally getting those who are dependent on the economy from participating in it and this is basically what I believe is the impetus behind Donald Trump's push we know in Belize, for example, we've had persons who have left, this, who left Belize to go to the U.S. Some for very short periods, periods of time because there are certain times when the hotels hire mm -hmm. uh, people from different countries to come in and work during high season or what have you. I have had a few people um, that I've represented uh, who have gone to the U.S. on those programs and come back. They would go for six months, they would go for sometimes three months, and then they come back on a cycle. But, and as I've said last week again, Donald Trump himself, in his private capacity, yes. has utilized uh, the visa policy yeah. as it relates to migrant workers. Um, I believe it came up about his um, resort in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, where he basically was hiring large numbers of persons from uh, Mexico and other places to work in his uh, resort um when there were in that area available labor that was locally there now he is saying now as the president-elect that what i did in my private capacity i did because the laws allowed me to do it yes and he is now saying listen i am going to attack those same laws that benefited me as a private individual so that other persons in private sector in private enterprise cannot abuse he knows where the, the US worker. He, he knows where the weakness is and so um, let's hope he can address it for the sake of the American people and of course uh, you know what he does also affects us so Patrick as a Belizean American who have lived in the US I don't know more than half your life you know a lot about our Belizean American situation you have worked and lived with our Belizean Americans there you know what we go through and you also know what's happening here so as much as we may have an issue or people may have an issue with what Donal is doing or intends to do that same situation is also an issue here in Belize as it regards migrant workers as it regards um, um, lower skilled workers and so forth no? as what uh, Arthur mentioned give us your take on this and also how you feel the, this um, abuse of visa program on, could undercut the American worker well actually I, I look at it from a whole different perspective okay. um, I look at it because they're talking basically this is a, a direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuse of visa programs that undercut the American worker I really don't think that the main concern here is the lower level worker if you want to call it that the main concern is the h1b worker and the h1b work visa um 
It's the same as getting into the top 50 universities in the US, pretty tough. Uh, what happened is that, for example, I think it was in 2014, they had 236,000 applicants fighting for 85,000 openings. They used basically a lottery program and 36% of the applicants were getting in. The problem is that what happened in the long run is that some of the companies were doing something that's illegal. It is illegal for you to apply more than once. If you apply, uh, if you're applying for this visa, you must apply only once. But some of the companies were using some of the, the, the subsidiary companies also to put the same person's name in on a different way, in a different way, so that the individual can actually get more a better chance of winning. And so you find, I think it was like 26,000 came in from India. India, India was, was winning it. And why were they getting it? It's because India has a very high level of skilled, see, I believe we're looking at skill of skilled IT workers. An area in North Dallas, it's called, um, skips me now, I used to live there. Anyway, it's north of Dallas, um, it, it's right near the airport. Um, and uh, nice area, ritzy area, yes. there are areas where have mostly Indians. Matter of fact, they just built a, a, um, a, a um, monument for uh, Gandhi, right there in that area, it's really nice. Uh, but again, to get back to this, Yes, yes, it is. It is. All, it is a lot of folks there. But again, to look at this, um, what you find is that this H-1B uh, uh, visa, uh, you find a situation where it says here that the top ten sponsors receive more than twenty-five thousand visas, accounting for nearly thirty percent of the quota in, in twenty fourteen. When you look at it, there is a situation that occurred that I'd like to mention. You had uh, Southern California Edison. And to me, this is a serious issue. Edison replaced 500 American tech workers with H-1B visa workers. That is a crime in my book. I mean, you're gonna kick out the American worker right in America, and you'll replace them with Indians to come in and take our jobs? I've got a problem with that. And Patrick, I see how you're doing because you studied IT. I also <laughs> taught IT. As a yeah. matter of fact, a friend of mine is listening right now. She's actually a Belizean right now sitting in, in, uh, in Houston. Spoke to her before I came on to that because she actually got to the U.S. on a student visa and her boss was going to apply for her to get an H-1B. Now she's in accounting, but she was also in forensic accounting. She's very intelligent. Yeah. So she could have gotten that visa, but the problem is that the guy died before he could apply for it. Um, so there's a lot of things, and in my class at Keller Graduate School of Management, my master's course, everyone in my class was from a different country. There were, I think it was 16 of us in our class. The only country represented twice was Belize. We had people from all over, from Europe, from England, from I'm just following. Yeah. And so the only country represented twice was Belize. Myself and her were in the same class. And, and so again, this issue is a serious issue because you're looking at uh, um, uh, sending applications twice. That's a part of the abuse of the program. You're also looking at a situation where, like I said earlier, you had uh, 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 Edison that, that did that. Um, and so now you have a lot of students coming in. That's awesome. The students that are coming in, and because I taught, I can tell you what this, the students that are coming in, they're also pumping in, they say about 36 billion was actually brought in by these students in 2015 to 2016. Yes. A lot of money coming in. So the best way to get into this now, because they're looking at probably cutting this H-1B visa uh, uh, lotto program in half. Well, if they do, the best place to be is in school in America. Because now you have an opportunity, once you graduate, to work for one year, and there, if the boss likes what you're doing, then they can apply for you for the H-1B. So that's the best best way to go. Right now. <laughs> well, Patrick, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and I understand what you're saying. I, um, I, someone like me who did both my degrees in the U.S., <laughs> I would fall into that bucket in terms of being able to qualify for that visa. And yes, I have been offered jobs numerous times in the U.S., so it would have been easy for me <laughs> to be living in the U.S. I understand what you're saying, and I also had a number of uh, friends also uh, from India, but not only from India. And they, some of them were not too pleased because they were not offered, they were not made offerings because of the situation. Sometimes the, 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 the visa 
application was sent late you know you have just a window I think it's early April and so they felt that it was unfair on them because the whole reason why their families helped them to attend school in the US was to do exactly what you are saying that Donald Trump or that's what you're saying intends to try and cut and that is these individuals go to the US with the intention unlike myself I I got them through scholarships their parents would pay for them to attend school there so that they will then be able to secure a US high paying job so you're saying this particular abuse of visa program one of it has to do with that H1 visa but, but actually, not really. I, I think okay. I, I probably yes, said it wrong. Yes, because you need to right. I think, yeah. explain let, it. Because let me now clarify. No, we no, no. have persons who right. also are in the same situation, and they, some of them may want to secure jobs. We have some of our very own Belizeans here that who want to get exactly what you're saying. He is looking to cut. So we want to hear exactly right. what you were saying. Exactly. Well, again, see, he's looking at cutting that H-1B. Because mm -hmm. if you look at it again, look what Edison did. If I was Donald Trump, I'd be as mad as you can be mad. Yes. You're taking 500 quality jobs from Americans and give it to foreigners. I don't play that game. I'm not into that. So the thing, the thing, what I'm saying is this. Yes. You see, I like all my all my classmates are foreigners. Okay. Every one of them. Yes. Um, I was the I was the the only one that actually I, I think lived in America. Everybody else came to America for school. Yes. Um, so the thing there is that if you grad once you graduate. And you go, you, you can work for one year. During that year that you're working, you can try to secure yes. and have the boss submit you for that. Yes. Trump is looking at what I understand at cutting, not that, but the lottery side. Okay. The lottery side where they have of the 236,000, 86,000 yes. is giving out on that lottery thing if you if your name is picked. Yes. That's not what he's looking at. Because okay. these guys went there on a student visa. Yes. And now they're applying uh, through their bosses would be applying for them to get a visa to stay in the US. It's a different story. All right. So we have two different situations and they would, uh, would affect both sets, two sets. And I'm telling you, this may be part of the abuse and what Arthur is saying, we have a lot of our Belizean brothers and sisters that may be wondering how this can affect them. But in Belize, some of us who have seen the show last week and have seen his video and even otherwise may be saying how can it affect them. When we return, we will be looking at that because we have a lot of persons who are looking to migrate to the US. There may be some to you know who simply want to go in and apply for a visa we look at that and see how if at all this particular immigration policy might affect this situation stay tuned Everyone benefits when individuals, companies, and entire communities become energy conscious. Energy conservation and efficient energy use, the way towards a happy, healthy Belizean society. Belize Electricity Limited, our mission is to provide reliable electricity at the lowest sustainable cost, stimulate national development, and improve the quality of life in Belize. Buying or selling land can be a daunting experience. Don't leave things to chance. When buying or selling land in Belize, seek the professional real estate services of Moya Shepherd and Company Limited. Benefit from our extensive local and international real estate network to find your dream home or to move your property from selling to sold. We are located at 5 Miles Philip Bolson Highway. Give us a call at 223-4465 or visit us at www.realestatebz.com. You are watching music videos, new movies, and live shows. Channel 9, only on the Belize Broadcasting Network. Yeah. 
Welcome back to the Sanaida Moya Show. I am your host, Sanaida Moya, and I have with me tonight two distinguished guests. Attorney at Law and Economist, Arthur Saldiva, and Professor Patrick Menzies. When we went to break just now, we were discussing specifically about what <laughs> this particular abuse may be, abuse of visa program may be. Now we want to bring it closer to home and see how it can affect Belize and Belizeans. Our Belizean Americans living in the U.S., we also have to look at that, but it may affect us right here. I'll start with you, Patrick. Let's hear from you. On how the visa program affects us at home? Yes. Okay, well, um, I, 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 I will say very sadly, um, we don't, I don't think, have that many skilled workers that have gotten their skills in Belize that will be applying for the H-1B um, to like on, on, a, on a scale like uh, India or China, because those are the guys that are getting it. Um, so I think it affects us in the sense of some of the folks that we've sent abroad, or that have gone abroad, sorry, to study, and they're applying for it, uh, for that particular visa. I really also don't think that the visa is in, in any way referring to a visitor's visa. A visitor's visa is a whole other ballgame. Uh, you apply a visitor's visa, you have a qualification, you know, you meet the basic qualification and, you know, let's go, you're, you're out of here. So that's a whole different ballgame. Only that they'll be looking keenly now as to when us Belizeans receive our visa, we go over there, they may be tracking us a bit more to see whether or not some of us may stay. I've had a few friends that have stayed within the U.S. and so that's also a situation, no? Um, at different levels. Well, well, so, well, well, yes, but, but that's dealing now with illegal migration. Mm -hmm. That's not dealing with this particular... Of course, Trump but is looking at the whole thing. It. It leads yeah, to yeah, 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 he's it, looking at the whole it thing. Leads to it. But right now, I believe that this thing is about labor because this is about the American jobs being taken by foreigners. And those yeah. people will stay. Some of our very own Belizeans, I know, they may very well stay. They go there on um, this, um, what is it, the, the, this, the tourism, I mean, yeah. I'm just going to talk the, the about, regular visa. yeah, the regular visa, I won't talk about the student, there are some students, um, but, but they go there and they say they're just going to go there based on visit, all right, visit whoever, family, friend, just a vacation, and they end up staying there, you can't find them, <laughs> right. they end up working, those are possible jobs, whether or not they get, they get paid, under the table. The point is they're there and they may take jobs from Americans. However, go ahead. I do want to say ahead. something though because there's there's a problem, especially in America. So not many Belizeans will be affected by this, but many, many Americans don't understand. I, I pastored for 18 years in the U.S. and sorry to say, but not sorry to say, uh, most of my members were illegals because I pastor Spanish churches in different parts of the United States. Um, there's something that many folks don't know. When you work in the U.S., you actually, although you are illegal, you can go to the IRS and you can get a TIN. I think it's called an ITN or a TIN. Yes. Uh, the, the TIN is the norm for business, but anyway, you, you, you get, you get a, this, this, this number, this ID number, yes. and you can actually work with that number and pay your tax. Now, again, you are illegal. However, America doesn't want you to be illegal, you hear me? <laughs> but pay your tax. So when a lot of poor, poor people are saying, well, you know, these illegal immigrants don't even pay taxes. That's not true. Maybe in Belize it's true, but not in the US. A lot of these guys actually do get their ID number and they do pay taxes. I don't know about Belizeans. I, I'm talking about a lot of Central Americans because that's who I deal with on yes. a normal, and Central South Americans, I deal with on a regular basis. I am, I spend, more, my friend, last year I spent more time in the US than I did here. And most of my life, I've lived in the U.S. So I've dealt with them, you know, not just to say I dealt with them, but I've dealt with them on a very personal level. Yes. And and so I speak from personal knowledge of what really is going on there yes. on that particular topic. Very good. Arthur? Well, as it relates to what uh, President-elect Trump has stated in his 100-day policy agenda, it is a departure for... I shouldn't say a departure. It wasn't inclusive 
of what he was speaking of in his campaign. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his campaign centered around the wall, centered around the deportation of illegals who are in the United States, um, especially those who he deemed to have been committing crimes, which nobody want the criminal element from any country in their own country. So, in so far as that is concerned, um, nobody can fault him for wanting undesirables out. Nobody can fault him for that. Was it he who said undesirables? No, well, <laughs> the basket of deplorables was yeah, Mrs. Yeah, yeah. Clinton. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different, a, 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 a different thing. But, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. It is no secret that the present president of the United States has deported the most people of any president in recent history. More than Bill Clinton, more than George Bush. Barack Obama has been the deportation president. Uh, I need to correct you. Please. Go ahead. Let me jump in here. You, 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 you misspoke, sir. Maybe I did. You misspoke. You said he deported more than Barack no, no. and Barack. Barack. So, sorry, sorry. Mo mo more than Bush, Bush and more than Clinton. Yes. I disagree. Okay. Let me tell you why. He deported more than Bush and Clinton put together. <laughs> and guess what? And guess what? That's the reality. And guess what? The Hispanics, I'm telling you, I was there. The Hispanics, because I vote, they were so excited to vote for Barack Obama because he loves the Hispanics and he will give us a chance. And you should have seen these guys. And guess what? He deported more of you than anybody else. Oh Okay, so the reality is, and here comes Billary. Sorry, they call her Hillary. We call her Billary. Oh, you know? But anyway, no. there comes Billary, and she was going to look out for Hispanics. Really? She was going to just follow Obama's trend. You did mention More you were a been. Republican um, <laughs> delegate. delegate. Yes, and I during was. During the last show, right? Okay. But yes, I was. I've been <laughs> related to what may be the fear of some Belizeans in the States at this time. Certainly, that is one of the major concerns that. Donald Trump would follow through on his uh, rhetoric um, where he is talking about employing a deportation force and what have you because that goes to exactly what Zenaida was mentioning where you have persons who go to the United States on visitors visa overstay their time slip through the cracks and are not seen or heard from uh, until we 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 don't until they get a ticket when they <laughs> get in the wreck right or they get dipped uh, so to speak now the situation is this there are opportunities certainly for people to be regularized and to become you know to gain a pathway to citizenship now whether or not Donald Trump will affect that or change that in any way we don't know we know, however, there are what they call sanctuary cities in the States. Yes. Uh, for example, Chicago, Houston. New York, <laughs> Houston. Yeah, all these places are what they call sanctuary cities. Mm -hmm. And um, persons who are there Ill illegally yes. go to these cities because the administration of those, the municipal administration or the city administration has certain programs and policies that allow for them to safely reside within those communities. So. And listen, it might be, you know, one of the reasons why you find that in many of these places there are large Belizean communities, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, yes. So the Belizean tend to live in these sanctuary cities. So I'm hoping, certainly, that for those who are there illegally, that before January the 9th, I think it is? 22nd. 22nd? Before January 22nd? 22nd. That they seek to do whatever is necessary to put themselves within the legal framework to have a pathway to citizenship. Because we don't know. And certainly nobody wants to be in an ambiguous and precarious situation where the future is concerned. But that's how one of the ways it could affect us if Mr. Trump goes the other, the other nine yards and deals with illegals in general. Because there are many Belizeans living in the States well, illegally. Arthur, um, do you think his proposed policy is targeting little um, um, citizens from little countries like Belize? Because I'll tell you something, once I was coming from, I was passing through the US, I, I think it was 
I don't know if I was coming from, I was coming from Europe. The point is, uh, I was in a line after a, a, a plane, another plane landed, a huge number of Mexicans yeah. came after. When I handed my passport, they looked through it and the officer said, he said, um, and yes, he was Caucasian. He said, uh, Miss Moya, he looked at it, he said, um, why why don't you stay in the u.s why haven't you visited you just go back and forth go back and forth you just in transit through i said um i said because and yes he did see i had studied there i said because i'm from belize i said um he said yes he said but so many people would stay here he said see behind see behind you and i said no i said because uh belize is my country i have all my family here there's no reason for me to stay in the u.s i'm very happy in belize he said, but I don't understand. See all those people behind you? And he kept saying, see all those people behind you? And I'm sure those right. Mexicans, they could understand. Right. Or most of them could understand. The point is, that was at his level. How he thought. <laughs> is You think Donald Trump is thinking the same way? You know what? It's not the Belizeans. The Belizeans are not on his radar. It's the Mexicans. That's why he spoke about that building, that wall. And he said it will get higher and higher. Will is it that 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 larger um, um, population, and even we don't want to go to the Muslims because it has to do with um, yes, and, and another situation why he looks at that. Go ahead. But here's the situation, right? In the 60s, 70s, and up through almost to the end of the 80s, the Belizean national identity was not what it is now. Belizeans, by and large, were seen as peace-loving progressive in terms of their um, educational stand or educational standards and our ability to to function within any society mm -hmm. and we were seen as desirable people to have anywhere a lot of us still are a lot of yes, Americans. but there has been a change in our identity as we are seen internationally now there has been an advent of violence in Belize that has been unprecedented for us and has been of such a nature that we have gotten international notoriety as a result of it. And when you hear a presidential candidate uh, speak about immigrants in a way that basically is saying, you know, this is what we don't want from the immigrants from Mexico because they are rapists and murderers many of them and this is Donald Trump's words then when you see if Mr. Trump would click on the Belizean media on a nightly basis during the week that there are two three four murders over to their period and this has happened every week every week every week young Belizeans are being killed by Belizeans and then it gives us this identity of a violent people mm -hmm. but we are not a violent people but this is what is being taken up internationally so certainly we would be on the radar not because of our size and our ability to swamp America with people but because of the quality of persons they perceive they are getting or you know from Belize so we, we have to look at it from that point of view here's the situation and I want to, to, to bring it down to the integrity because we are talking about immigration yes. for Belize the unskilled labor is where we have the biggest problem here in Belize we have a wide influx a large inflow of unskilled people coming into the country mm -hmm. They come into the country to pick oranges, to pick bananas, where the understanding was and has always been that they would be here for a short period of time to assist in the harvest season for these crops and then leave. Mm -hmm. But instead, we have these communities that have been formed as a result of allowing the large growers to bring the immigrants in. For example, places like Bella Vista, 
which went from a population size of a few hundreds in the 1990s. Let people know where Bella Vista is in but Bella Vista is in the Toledo, Toledo. Uh, East constituency. Okay. It's um, uh, just off this, on the southern highway going towards Punta Gorda. Okay. Now, that community is one of the largest communities in the country, bar none, at this particular juncture, with a population exceeding 12,000 in less than 10 years. It's a, it's a big population for us, I mean. No, <laughs> we, we juxtapose that with Valley of Peace, San Martin, Salvapan, and these communities that are on the periphery of Bumapan, mm -hmm. which came into being in 1978, when immigrants were allowed under the refugee status due to the war in Salvador to settle in that area. Those communities also grew very fast, and they are very large. They rival the size of Bumapan itself. In fact, Valley of Peace has as much, if not more, population than Roaring Creek. Now, this situation has caused a crowding out yes. of Belizean workers from traditional farm, from their traditional farm societies because the people come with the same set of skills mm -hmm. and they do it for less. Mm -hmm. Now, given that situation, we have widespread unemployment among certain groups of persons in Belize. Mm -hmm. Due to that unemployment in rural areas, we have a lot of young Belizeans who have gravitated and moved into the cities. Yes. It's a funny deal because every gang in the city has a rural leader. The leaders of the gangs in Belize city either come from places like Lemonal, places like uh, Gales Point, Manatee, places like um, Rancho Dolores and these other communities. Okay. So when you look at what has happened, uh, the, the, the sociological impact mm -hmm. of the immigration problem in Belize has a direct correlation with the violence in the city of Belize. Very interesting, very interesting. I do want to <coughs> say something before we yes. switch, and that is that you mentioned about Belizeans being seen through a different prism because of what's happening locally. <clears throat> but I do want to say that when you compare applying for a visa in Belize, a regular visitor's visa, it is super easy compared to Central America and South America, like Colombia. These, these guys have a hard time. I speak to a lot of folks. They have a very hard time because their quota is more than likely they have so many people right. and so the difference is pretty big so really and truly i agree with what you're saying i'm only saying that I, i'm not talking that, about it from the application aspect in terms of applying for the visa i'm what, saying being to, to be able to actually not apply anybody can apply but yeah. i'm saying to be actually be able to to receive a yeah. visitor's visa yeah. secure a, a, a visitor's visa it is a lot easier to do so as a belizean than as a Salvadorian, Guatemalan, Honduran, whatever. Yeah. It's a lot easier. So we thank God for that. So at least for now, no, certainly. you know, we do have, for now, um, and we hope that, that we could actually be in the good graces of the administration, the administration where we can keep that that way. And when we come back, we're going to go to another ad break. And when we come back, I want to discuss a little bit more about the visa situation and the and applying as a Belizean, um, we know that we also have a number of artists, right? Excellent Belizean artists that want to apply for visas. Now it's very strict, um, it's not easy. We've had one of our own um, that was sent back. And uh, you know, this, this individual highly, highly, highly skilled, you know, highly artistic but was sent back and we don't want that situation to happen again but it may not be easy for that person to receive a visa. I recently saw a situation with this highly talented uh, orchestra instructor from I believe he was from Argentina. When he got to Detroit, now I studied in Detroit so I keep and I look at what's happening there. When he got to the, to the airport there 
they asked him, what, what are you doing here? He said, oh, he came here. Um, they sent for him. They, 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 they've asked him to come and, you know, instruct as it regards to this huge event that they had, orchestra. Oh, they had him there for such a long time. Highly skilled individual. They sent him back home. They deported him. They sent him right back home, even though... Was they, he going to be paid? Yes, he was See, going to be problem. paid. If he went on a visitor's visa, because I, I know buddies of mine... He said that Mexico. the individuals had, um, because they did tell him yeah. they were to have applied for you. Mm -hmm. He said, well, they applied. They told me they applied. That's what they said. That's what he told him. He said, they told me they applied. Um, yes, they applied. So he doesn't understand what, what happened. This may happen to certain individual even in Canada. So but we won't go to Canada. We're sticking to the US. Right. But this is a situation we have our artists that need to go there. We want our artists to go into the US and, and represent Belize and, and and really the Belizean Americans want them there as well. But we want them there overall to entertain and to represent Belize abroad. When we get back, we're gonna discuss that further. Stay tuned. All right, Aaron, it's Team Carbass. Fast. Comfortable. Affordable. And powered by the trusted Cummings ISF 2.8 liter turbo diesel engine. We change the way the game is played. The new Photon Tunneling Truck and View CS2 Van. Available at Universal Hardware. Photon, the game changer is here. Come and dine at our Belizean owned restaurant for your hunger cravings. We offer a variety of fried and grilled finger foods and local dishes. We also do catering and host small socials and children's parties. Enjoy a relaxing and safe environment with your family and friends at affordable prices with excellent customer service. We are located at Mile 1 on the Philip Golson Highway across from Gonzalo Quinto and Sons. Call us at 667-2200 for orders and deliveries. Cravings, where patience equals fresh food. You are watching music videos new movies and live shows channel 9 only on the belize broadcasting network Welcome back to the Sanaida Moya Show. I am your host, Sanaida Moya. We have with us tonight attorney at law and economist, Arthur Saldiver, and we have Professor Patrick Menzies on my far left. Gentlemen, when we went to the ad break, we, I, 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 I told you I wanted to discuss the situation as it regards our Belizean, or talented Belizean artists that may want to go abroad. We don't want anything or anyone to be stopped when they reach the U.S. Discuss with us the situation. Well, Zenaida, one of the main things is the information that is given to the consulate when applying for the visa. It is a requirement to be forthcoming with the truth of your purpose for visiting the States. If you are going as a visitor to be a tourist in the States, then you state that you, when you have your interview and you're granting the visa, B1, on that basis. If you do something in the United States that is contrary to what you stated you were going to do, then obviously that's a problem. Nobody gets a visa as a right. There is no right to a visa. The country that issues the visa grants you a privilege a privilege that you will be allowed to maintain for as long as you abide by the rules and conditions uh, governing its, its grant. When artists have gone 
to the to the states and performed and have been paid. Uh, you know, you know. Listen, I know my people. You know, so if we go get to it, I'll eat thing when I try. But would they receive that artist visa? That, that well, would they receive it? This is the thing. If it is that the Belizean community seeks to have particular artists come over, mm -hmm. then the community needs to come together and petition and write. Those who are legally there, mm -hmm. petition and write, either use their congressman, their senator, and then ad address the State the Department. Entity needs to apply apply for so go the, well, the, the entity um, needs to apply when it, for... As a matter of fact, uh, when it comes to certain persons who are mentioned, and I won't mention the name, right. yeah. that may be where we need to go because I know exactly who is being spoken of. And the, the thing about it is this: when you go to the states, you make friend, you so make money, <laughs> and you don't pay the taxes on the money you earn. That is a violation, a violation that is seen as very egregious mm -hmm. to the U.S. That you are profiting there and you are not giving Uncle Sam his fair share to take. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the problems. That was one of the reasons why our friend, All right. right our friend, Extremely talented was, person. was made to come back. Now, she may still be given a chance to go back if the community comes to her aid. I hope they do. I and sincerely hope they do. Once the community comes to her aid, it means then that she's going to have to declare her purpose. Yes. And she's going to have to declare her earnings and those earnings are going to be taxed. She will be able to come back with the proceeds, yes. less what is taxed, yes. but she will have to pay the tax. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I see what you're saying. To, to me, for example, of course, after working <coughs> and establishing the Belizean of, the Office for the Belizean Diaspora here in Belize, yes. I have knowledge or worked with and, and known some great people in the US that represent uh, our country in the different um, major cities. And to me, for example, let's say Chicago Day in the Park, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, Chicago Day in the Park, you want to go there. Well, there's a committee and the committee can apply for you. We also have an individual that can help who represents, who works there, uh, represents to a great extent the foreign, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And you can even, if necessary, get a letter from, I, I don't see why, I can get a letter from the mayor's office saying that this event is an annual event and that they endorse it. And so it's just something as simple, you don't have to go all the way up to Congress and senators, that is way up there, but I mean, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, again, I'm not sure whoever is where, but the reality is that uh, th that I don't see. As a matter of fact, one, one good example. Um, <coughs> I shouldn't even get here, but um, my <laughs> wife applied for a visa uh, earlier this year um, to go, and the problem is that I'm an American, so she's supposed to apply for a visa, which actually is for permanent residence. You hear that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because she's supposed to apply, but I don't want to go live in the U.S. Yes. So why would you apply for a permanent permanent residence? You have to spend six months out of the year. Yes. I don't want to spend six months out of the year. Yes. I mean, last year I spent a lot more than six months, but that's not what I want to do. Yes. So therefore, why would we get a permanent resident type visa? So anyway, she got a visa to go for training. Uh, they only gave her one year. People normally give in 10 years. They only gave her one year. Yes. And I guess to try and pressure me to apply for that permanent res residence visa, which is what I'm supposed to do as an American. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't want to do that. Yes. So I'm just hoping that um, next year she reapplies and they give her another visa. If not, I'm stuck like Chuck. I've got to apply for a permanent <laughs> resident visa. And I don't want to spend that time in the U.S. I want to stay in Belize. Well, I want to discuss about migration. I mean, right. what would be the situation? What do you think with Trump's proposed uh, immigration policy, is there any effect, any possible effect as it, regret, as, 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 as it relates to that situation? Not really. I, I think what he's saying is that he just wants those who come to the U.S. come through the proper channels. Mm -hmm. Once you come through the proper channels, the legal channels, there's no issue. And um, again, that is what everyone should want. You see, it's different than how we have been practicing our immigration situation here in Belize, where persons break the law and come here, uh, and every election cycle, they are granted citizenship in order to give votes. Yes. Persons from countries that shouldn't even be granted Belizean citizenship. No. Like where? Listen. <laughs> the Constitution of Belize expressly provides, <laughs> ex express provides that no country no citizen of a country who has a claim on Belize 
can be a citizen of Belize. Let me, well, we know which country has a claim on Belize. Let me let me word that for you, my brother. Yes, we know That's that. Section 29 of the Constitution of Belize and also Chapter 161 of the Laws of Belize, which is the Nationality Act. And what it basically says is that anyone who is a country, who is from a country, or uh, has allegiance to, see, there's something very careful, yes. something that people are not looking at. Yes. The, the Constitution doesn't only say if, you, if you're a citizen of a country. It says, or you have allegiance to. Mm -hmm. yes. I may be Salvadorian and have allegiance to a country which the only one in the world is Guatemala mm -hmm. that does not recognize the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or independence of Belize. Very important, the word or and not the word and. What does that mean? If a country recognizes our independence, like Guatemala did once, but does not recognize our territorial integrity, their citizens of, or anybody that has, has any type of allegiance to Guatemala does not qualify for Belizean citizenship, right. period. Mm -hmm. So it's or and not and. So these are the three key things. It's not the claim. It is one, if they don't recognize the independence, two, territorial integrity, and three, or sovereignty, they cannot obtain Belizean citizenship. Now I'll say it right here. The red and the blue folks that have been doing it, and one young man told me that, the pri again, his words, the Prime Minister himself signed off on theirs. These people should go to jail and be tried for treason. It is a violation of the Constitution, but then our great, my great ex-friend, minister, senator, whatever he is now, Godwin Hulse, the man that fixes it all, and I will say a name, and I'm saying it. Yeah. He um, found a way around it. And supposedly, supposedly, now that if a Guatemalan denounce their citizenship, they can now obtain Belizean citizenship. Liar, pants on fire. That, that is been. not true. I met with the Guatemalan embassy, and the Guatemalan law states once a citizen always a citizen. You cannot denounce. denounce your Guatemalan citizenship. The guy at the Guatemalan okay. embassy told me, he said, it is not even worth the paper. <laughs> it is written on. And this is from the Guatemalan embassy itself. Belizeans, you are being taken for a ride. But Patrick, and too many of you are enjoying it. Not only that, Patrick. Parker? Most of these people have Spanish as their native and only tongue. The Belizean official language and the language of the immigration department where it relates to this denunciation is in English. So when you are telling this person that if you so and so do denounce the government of Guatemala, they don't understand what is being said to them. They are saying yes because that's what they are being told to say but they don't understand exactly what they are doing. So how can that ever be valid? It cannot be valid because the person doesn't understand the legal implication of what he's doing. He is doing it simply because he knows that there's a reward at the end of it for him. And that reward is a paper that says that he's a nationalized Belizean. Now, this is a problem. This is a big problem. Here we have the situation now, and, I, and we're going to get into certain other areas here. And I want to stick to immigration, but the big elephant in the room is the ICJ situation where we have a referendum supposedly sometime in the future we are I, I don't think that we should but the powers that be are hell-bent on doing it where they are now reducing the threshold for it to pass of the immigrant population in Belize the vast majority is Guatemalan the vast majority of Belize, of immigrants from any country coming here is Guatemalan this is very ironic, but not very ironic. I mean, ironic in, is in that they are not to have that huge population right. to, to begin with. But, 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 right? but, because but, 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 but the population is not a problem. Oh, no, However, they're right next door. Right. But the population is not a problem, you know, if you want to look at that, to a certain extent. The problem isn't the fact that there's a large population in Guatemala. 
most many of our pastors in our alliance are Guatemalans. Okay? So I've got to be real clear. Mm -hmm. That's not really the issue. The issue isn't that they are here. The issue is that they are given citizenship. Oh, they yes, got here that's the issue. citizenship. Yes. Right. Because you see, when someone says, well, Mr. Menz, what are you going to do? Create a second uh, a group, a group of second class citizens? No. What we're saying is that constitutionally, there is a law. There is a constitution, supreme law of the land. And it is very clear. If you're from the country of Guatemala, and you, both your parents, none of your parents are Belizeans, because this is a different issue. If I, if my wife goes to have a child in Guatemala, happens to be Guatemalan by birth, but also Belizean by birth, and also American by birth, because we're Belizean in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not the issue here. The issue here is a Guatemalan, not born of Belizean parents, that is in Belize, is legally not authorized to be a citizen of Belize. That is the issue. The issue isn't the fact that somebody's here from a different country. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just like what Trump's trying to do. Do you agree with the undesirables? As a matter of fact, I don't even think Guatemala, and I'm gonna get shot in the head for this, but I don't even think that Guatemala is really the biggest issue when you talk about the, some of the social ills that we are facing. It's actually El Salvador. Because a lot of the maratruchas or whatever they call them, the, the folks from the pandillas and the folks that are causing a problem and, and cobrando rent and charging people in El Salvador. Salvadorians are suffering tremendously. So the Bible tells us about being careful about how we treat foreigners in our land. I'm a foreigner to a certain extent in America, but I'm a US citizen, but I got there as a foreigner. So I need to respect foreigners in my land the same way I want to be respected in another land. All right. But there are rules I must apply I must apply by the rules. I must play by the rules, sorry. I, I must submit myself to the rules. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have in Belize is that, one, the politicians are the number one problem. Two, the Belizeans are the number two problem. Why are they number two? Because even though I'm telling you this right now, not, not even probably 10 of you will do anything about what you're learning tonight. And that's a problem. The time to save your country is before you lose it. Exactly. But we always expect the other guy to do it for us. You need to get off your rear end All right. and do something about it. We're going to go to our third and final break. And when we come back, we'll hear the last comments and we'll wrap up this segment. Wrap up the show, actually. <laughs> Already? <laughs> For doubling, doubling reasons to share a chair and have some fun, let's double your chair with Western Union. Double the laughter, double the feeling, double excitement, double the season. Start sending to your loved ones. Let's double your chair with Western Union. Tis the season for sending and winning with Western Union. Send or receive any qualifying money transfer through December 31 and be automatically entered for a chance to win double your transaction amount up to a weekly 250 US dollars prize. This is doubling your Christmas cheer. This is Western Union, moving money for better. Complete rules at participating agent locations. Buying or selling land can be a daunting experience. Don't leave things to chance. When buying or selling land in Belize, seek the professional real estate services of Moya Shepherd and Company Limited. Benefit from our extensive local and international real estate network to find your dream home or to move your property from selling to sold. We are located at 5 Miles Philip Bolson Highway. Give us a call at 223-4465 or visit us at www.realestatebz.com. You are watching music videos, new movies, and live shows. Channel 9, only on the Belize Broadcasting Network.
Welcome back to the Sanada Moya show. I am your host Sanada Moya and we have Mr. Arthur Saliva and Mr. Patrick Menzies. There's something that we we touched on but I'd like us to wrap that up as well, the student visas. Patrick, tell us tell us about that part glass situation, how it can affect. Well, again, um, I just want to share what was shared with me. So if you want any, any more information, please contact the us.gov. Anyway, it's good. Uh, um, basically, the most important thing when you want to go get a student visa is make sure, you know, it depends on your school grades. If your grades are where it's supposed to be, then that is awesome. Number two, the university you're applying to must accept you. Uh, number three, um, you must have a sponsor or money for yourself to cover your fees. Four, um, you know, you should show a bank statement that you, the, the funds are there. Uh, number five, while in the U.S., uh, you can apply for scholarships, not grants. Grants is money that's normally given to Americans, not students applying from foreign. Um, a grant, of course, is money you don't pay back. Uh, you must, number six, keep your grades uh, where it's supposed to be or risk being sent back. I was informed that um, according to the immigration department, you must maintain 12 credits per semester. Problem is that if you start to go down, this university may drop you to only nine credits. That's a problem. Uh, there are situations where they, they can apply for a, uh, what we'll call a, an exemption, uh, but that is something else that's there. Belize is they're applying for H-1B. Um, if you're applying for H-1B, it really helps if you are bilingual. That is really a plus. Um, and right now in Houston, so Creole, fact, Creole won't count as uh, as, as being bilingual. Creole there, and English, please. come on, come please on. don't go there. I, I know that some Belizeans and we say we're probably, trilingual. We're, we're, so we we're probably do that Creole. Be, be hit me on the head with this, but I don't call it Creole a language. All I really right, don't. Right, so that's a whole other issue. That's, Creole is a dialect. We say we're trilingual. When we go, we say oh. Right. English, Spanish, and Creole. Creole. So right. I'll right. just let Sounds you know okay, that. But anyway, yeah. I'm going to let that one slide. <laughs> anyway, but Belizeans apply for H-1B. Uh, there is a situation right now, Houston is, there keeps, I shouldn't even say this because I'm trying to get rid of all the people, but Houston is begging for math, science, and special ed teachers big time. Uh, they're also begging for folks, folks in STEM, you know, the science, technology, yes. engineering, and math. So that's something that you're looking at. And I was also told that McDonald's also is hiring, of course, but that's basically the unskilled labor. Um, and what else? Um, nurses. Chicken plants and nurses. Nurses. You know, nurses. Um, Believe so, in nurses. Of right, right. So th there are stuff. things over there, are jobs over there that are available for Belizeans. Um, the and thing so, is that you, they, they'll have to apply, the, the, the particular entity will have to apply on behalf of the individual and show that that particular entity has advertised and cannot get a person to, to take on that position. Right. You, you know, I would like to share something right yes. quick. There's something that I have never shared in my life, but I need to share it today. Yes. When I was in Belize, right here, we took our G, GCE. Back yes, then? yes. The GC at Nazarene High School. And um, I'm from King's College. Yes. Proud to be from King's. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, we you, you have to put the, uh, not the GS, the, the GC, is the one for the US, which is the ASVAB. Uh, not the ASVAB, the military. The ACT. The ACT. I'm so military. ACT. <laughs> the ACT. When you apply for the ACT, what I did was you have to put two universities you would like to go to. Mm -hmm. I put Chicago University. Mm -hmm. My mom lived in Chicago. Yes. I never thought much about it. Mm -hmm. When I got to the U.S., I was trying to join the military. Well, my, my two younger brothers uh, had to go back to high school. Well, they were going to drop them one grade, okay. and nothing could be done because Belize education, they said, was less, so they were going to drop them. Okay. Thank God I put on my ACT Chicago University, because I was, and so we were stuck with my younger brother, but I was going to join the Army. Yes. Well, the recruiter took me to Chicago University so they can verify my high school diploma from King's College. Mm -hmm. Unknown to me was the fact that they had accepted me at Chicago University. So they were like, Mr. Menzies, we accepted you. So why don't you come to school here? Yes. I said, no ma'am, I am joining the Army. She said, okay. So she certified my diploma and said, your education in Belize is higher back then, no, no, <laughs> higher than that of the United States. 
And so with her certification, not only did I join the military with a qualified high school diploma, but I was able to put my younger brothers in school the next grade up mm -hmm. as they were supposed to take. So you never know. So if you take the ACT in Belize, and again, I don't know if you guys do that anymore or not, mm -hmm. but if they do, they do, please pay attention to what university you apply to, because one day you may have to fall back on it. I fell back on it and it saved me one year of high school, but after I had to go back and it saved my younger brothers also one year of high school. I think um, St. John's College, yeah. um, six, well, six Warner College, Junior College now, I know uh, we had to sit it uh, before we even uh, was were selected for a scholarship. So the point is, uh, we have a lot of Belizeans that may fall into that bucket. So it's good that you're bringing that particular right. issue up. But we have intelligent, intelligent Belizeans who go over there. And when they go to the US, a lot of times we are seen as way brighter Yes. than our um, fellow American students. Yes. So I'm just letting you know, and I, I know. Well, well don't, don't yeah. just I know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> I, I, I do want to give the example, yes. sorry. The example is that my, my youngest brother, he would, they, I mean, they put him in the, in the next class up, and they thought that this guy was a genius. Mm -hmm. Because the stuff they were doing one, one class up, which was high school, he left here at, at primary, he had already taken. Yes. Okay? And, and uh, not to blow my own whistle, but yes. you know, when I was in the military, my ASVAB score was high enough, I could take any job that they offered. So yes, uh, um, that is something recognized uh, for, for Belizeans. That's right. One of the things that I um, certainly feel we have lost in terms of the opportunities is that even to this day, there are a great demand for nurses in the US, in Texas, California, and a lot of these big states, a lot of great demand. but. Belize is not producing the nurses as we used to because the whole nursing school situation has has gone. Yeah. And this is where I think we have done our population a great disservice because we are we have become very reliant on foreign nurses here in Belize. Mm -hmm. When Belize had a reputation for producing excellent nurses. Uh, so, I hope that persons listening, if they are persons of influence, could start again pushing yeah. for a reopening of the nursing school because it's another avenue for our people, not because we want all our nurses to go to the U.S., Was it Dr. but because Bulwar? we also want... I, I had heard uh, Bernard Bulu. Mm -hmm. I had, I think I had seen a Facebook post that he had did on what you're explaining. And um, yes, so our nurses, uh, they uh, back then it, it was seen that you know it was a positive, and now maybe the direction needs to be shifted huh. back to where it was. We, so. we are wondering why our healthcare system is failing in Belize. Mm -hmm. A big reason is because there's a communication gap. Yes, not because the nurses that come from Cuba and Ghana and other places are not excellent nurses. Mm -hmm. But because, by and large, the population they are serving don't speak their language or don't understand the accent that they have. And we have to, again, not only make healthcare accessible, and when we talk about it being accessible, it's not only from the point of view of the money you have in your pocket or don't have in your pocket, but it's also in the ability to communicate with your healthcare provider so that they understand what ails you, what, where you have your pain. And where do you need your help? Well, I, I don't think it's only a language problem. I really think, and Belizeans that have been to the hospitals, God help you. I think there's also a problem with a culture difference. Because the way how some of the foreign nurses treat Belizean patients is a shame. I am just, I'm just being clear. I have seen it. I've heard many reports of it. It is a shame. So there is a cultural problem, and it's time for us to take back our healthcare system. However, I do want to also say, we're talking about all this stuff, and we're going to get to the U.S. Folks, we don't want to get rid of all our brightest and our you best. Know, exactly. So I just want you to understand that part. We're That's just explaining right. that, you know, the things that are available out there, but please, if you've got what it takes, as a matter of fact, 
No, I we do. We do have a high unemployment situation, Listen, and yes. a lot of the highly skilled. It's not only the blue collar workers that are affected. A lot of highly skilled individuals are sitting at home, jobless, yes. and even if they want to open their own business, the enabling environment isn't there for them. Yes. So we have to we have to bring up. But what I will tell you is that this show is about not only discussing issues in a balanced and objective manner, it's about looking at opportunities, ways for Belizeans, and I will say not only uh, born Belizeans, Belizeans, all Belizeans, even those who have become Belizeans, naturalized. naturalized. So we will be looking at it in a manner to inform, educate, and empower and so next week we will be discussing a very strategic plan a plan that I believe can not only help the situation as it regards to Guatemala's claim on Belize but we had Mr. Price bringing us to political independence or we now want to move to economic independence yes. all right that's what we're looking at and i i sincerely feel that the time is here for us to move to that level so next week we'll be discussing that i want you to stay tuned i want to thank all our first of all thank our guests i mean you know uh, patrick arthur you both are very insightful individuals and and that's why i enjoy discussing with you and i and and i brought you on as as, as the first guest because i wanted an objective view but i don't only want an objective view i want to hear it from individuals who feels it who knows it who are there and um in your professions in your lives you understand what's happening i want to thank our sponsors Belize Electricity Limited. It's through their courtesy that we are able to broadcast to you. Belize Electricity Limited. Zetro International. We spoke about the, 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 the transfers, the remittances. Zetro International. You can go there, utilize them. We also want to thank Universal Hardware. Uh, please support our sponsors, Cravens Restaurant at a ma One Mile, Philip Golson Highway awesome delicious food moya shepherd and company limited for real estate investment make sure you look at moya shepherd and company limited i want to thank bbn i want to thank rocky's salon studio who of course uh have been doing a very good job um and with my hair some I think it looks good. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Slingshot Advertising and Science. Thank you. And next week, I also want to thank all the individuals who are making this possible as well, behind the scene or technical uh, persons. Uh, Raymond Shepard, thank you. Uh, we want to thank Melvin Lopez, Marvin Martinez, Ramon Vasquez and I want to ask you to also join us on Facebook you the viewers you have made this show a success already you have been inputting uh, to the the Sinaida Moya show Facebook page go ahead remember uh, we want to hear your views, your comments, the next, top, the next topics you will want us to discuss. We've had a few from you already. We want to ensure that you also watch repeats of this show. BBN uh, will be doing repeats. And of course, you go to the Sinaida Moya uh, uh, show Facebook page as well. We want to thank, I want to thank, uh, so the viewers, I want to thank all my friends, my family, my little daughter, Natalia, who may be watching at home or sleeping, and my little son, Kelvin Lebron. Thank you very much. Thank you for inspiring me to do this show. Next week, join us right here at the BBN Studios for another episode of the Sinaida Moya Show. Until then, be safe, be blessed, be happy. See you next week.